Hey, what's up, sweaties? It's John Schnepp here once again on the 30th episode of Collider Heroes. That's right. You're watching Collider Heroes number 30. Thanks for uh, tuning in. This week, very special guest. John can't be, can't be here. He's on a conference call. They got him locked down. So, Robert Meyer Burnett, thank you for being here this How week. How you doing, John? Always a, a pleasure to be here and getting sweaty with you. Right on, man. Well, we're going to be getting extra sweaty this coming weekend at Stan Lee's Kamikaze. Both me and Robert both have panels. I'll be showing The Death of Superman Lives What Happened at 1 p.m. on Saturday. And, and Robert, when is your screening? Uh, I don't know when our screening is, but you can come find me at the uh, Star Trek Axonar booth. And we're having a booth. We're having a booth. We're having a panel discussion about Axanar, the film, and come hear all about it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Plus, you just come down because it's all sweaty all yeah, weekend. Yeah, it's going to be great. We've got a booth. It's booth 329. We'll be selling our Blu-rays and, and DVDs and posters of the Death Superman Lives, what happened. So definitely come down to Stan Lee's Kamikaze this weekend. We'll be here. We'll be there. The whole uh, Collider Movie Talk crew and the Schmoes will be there on Sunday. So definitely come down. We're going to hit it right now with the very first topic. It's the Joker revealed on Empire Magazine, looking incredibly frightening and scary. Jared Leto talks about his transformation to the clown prince of crime and what a transformation it is. Empire Magazine recently released a ton of new pictures from the upcoming August release of Suicide Squad, 2016's when it's coming out, where we get some even more, even more background on the Joker, Harley Quinn, Satana, Enchantress. They just released this morning another Two covers of Enchantress. There, there's the Enchantress cover. She's creepy as hell. I kind of want to date her. The, so. We were talking about how creepy yet sexy yet scary she is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the uh, the images that were released in the Empire magazine. Well, again, I mean, I think you you hit it on the nail on the head when you said the Crown Prince of Crime. I mean, again, we're getting a look at the Joker that's very different. Which I think is great. We're not seeing Nicholson's Joker. We're right. not seeing Cesar Romero's no. Joker. We're not seeing Heath Ledger's Joker. We're seeing a brand new incarnation that looks to be a dark, really dark take on that idea of the Crown Prince of Crime. And I think it's great. Yeah. I mean, I think it, he looks fantastic. Scary. And I want to see. I mean, it made me want to see it. Yeah, especially the, the pictures that they released of Harley Quinn. As when she was just Dr. Quinzel right. sitting right across from the Joker in a restrained, you know. I mean, I want to see a Clarice Hannibal Lecter relationship where she gets seduced by him. We're not and, probably, we won't get that much. He, that's like, I'm guessing that's flashbacks. Probably. I highly doubt we'll get a lot of screen time of this storyline. Maybe they, they did it as an extra long one and they'll be like, oh, buy the Blu ray, you get a whole half hour of them <laughs> before Harley Quinn, you know. And I just like the fact that the Joker obviously is resurrecting Prince's band, The Revolution. <laughs> that's right. Because well, you what? You know, he's also resurrecting the look of the homeless, and as well as, well as uh, some you know brand new uh, tattoos going out there. He's he's really in style. He is I mean, he's style. wearing like you know Arkham you know sweatpants, no shoes, just foot foot loose and fancy free. Tons of tattoos, and uh, you know he's got a pr pretty crazy yeah like a just alligator like purple alligator jacket. I love it. Yeah, we were talking about how this this version Jared definitely is like channeling a lot of different Jokers from the past, but. When I see that cover, I instantly think of the Dark Knight Returns Joker. Like that creepy, like kind of with totally. lipstick and like darling, you know, like <laughs> right. creepy. And, and that's, I mean, I think what's really interesting is is how there's sort of an, an amalgamation of comic influences. They're not just looking at one thing. They're looking at a number of things. Like it, it's come out this week that the, the, uh, Batman versus Superman is not just the Dark Knight Returns, right. but there's other influences. And I kind of, I think that's really great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you know Batman v Superman. Obviously, we're going to see that first, and then I keep hearing rumors that all these other films, like Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman, are prequels to Batman v Superman. Right, which is kind of weird. Right, it's kind of, it is kind of weird, but kind of neat. I yeah. mean, we know Batman's in the movie, but yeah. it comes out after. So, is Suicide Squad a prequel to Batman versus? I don't know. Superman? I'm just glad Batman's in it. We see him like flying around on a car. What other scenes is he going to be in? So. I don't know. I can, but it looks good. I again, though, I wonder about the tone. You know, because it, it's pretty out there. I just hope the characters don't act as outrageous as they look. Right, we need to be a little more grounded. A little bit more grounded. And, you know, honestly, I feel like with that cover of the Enchantress, I don't know if she's going to be actually the bad, bad guy. Like right. the bad guy's fighting the badder villain, which right. is her. Right, Because um, I wouldn't want to go against her, you know. I was like... No, I mean, the Enchantress versus Harley Quinn, 
Are they going to out crazy one another? Right. And does the Enchantress have like magical powers? Uh, yeah, I don't it's know. Like, it's going to get weird. All right. Speaking of weird, Ash versus the Evil Dead. Now, Bruce Campbell is finally back after all this time in a brand new 10 episode series, Ash versus the Evil Dead, which has the chin and Sam Raimi returning to the comedy horror genre that started their careers and has entertained entertained millions the first four minutes went online before its upcoming halloween debut let's get bloody and talk about it robert you got the chance to watch the first four i minutes. did i watched the first four minutes so i i worked on army of darkness nice yeah. what did you do on? i was the i was the makeup effects production assistant for tony gardner's shop mm. and we did evil ash and all the deadites nice so i was at intravision for years uh, for months it seemed like years and at acton where they built the castle set uh, nice. It was it was amazing. I mean, it was one of my earliest jobs in the in the film business, but it was so much fun to work on, and it's great to see Bruce Campbell come back playing Ash. But I thought the first four minutes was was great. I mean, he's getting into a girdle, then he just rolls up into a bar after he's put on a girdle to try and pick up a girl. Right. And he leaves the girdle on when stuff happens. I just think that was yeah, that it's was, pretty fantastic. And it, it and you know, at the very end, you guys should watch it. I don't want to ruin yeah, the ending. Yeah, it's good. Just watch all four minutes. Don't leave before seeing all four minutes. And and it's Sam Raimi directing. He's directed this first episode, right? And they're back. You know, he's obviously producing all ten episodes. So uh, it had the flavor of what is kind of like the newer. Bruce Campbell kind of comedy bits right. mixed with that Evil Dead kind of flavor. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, Sam Raimi made a movie uh, called The XYZ Murders. And I, I mean, I don't think he gets enough. He hasn't done enough comedy lately. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's brought his comedy stylings to Spider-Man. But he's a funny, darkly oh, yeah. sardonic. I mean, that guy... He, he can bring the, bring the humor when he wants to. And this show looks amazing. I mean, it looks exactly like what I think everybody wants yeah. from Evil Dead. Well, I mean, the, the weird thing that I kept hearing as we were in production is they can't use any of the Army of Darkness because the rights are all split up between the people who own the Evil Dead, the Evil Dead 2, and Army of Darkness. Right. All the rights are all strangely, weirdly put together. But because Evil Dead and the Evil Dead 2 were basically, Evil Dead 2 was just a glorified remake, that even Evil Dead, they could still mine all that stuff. Right. And it's the exact same thing with the hand cut off, the chainsaw, everything pretty much, except for Army of Darkness going back in time. They can't do that. Right. But they can actually probably, if they wanted to, go back in time, just not there. Well, it's interesting. Do, do the rights holders, you know, because Army of Darkness famously has two endings. Mm. So do they go into the, can they go into the future? Because they didn't use that ending. That's right. Or... Uh, the, or is S Smart out? S Smart's out. S Smart's out. S Smart's out. So it's the second one they can't actually use any of the elements All from. Right. So they are, but it's sort of like, hey, it's just a remake of the first one. So taking the first one and then extrapolating on that, there's easily ten episodes. Absolutely. I so, mean, I, I can't wait. And it, clearly, there's there's now a deadite in every every bar in America. That's so right. There's a lot of it's people. A big, it's to a big take problem on. Uh, that Ash has to handle. <laughs> this is starting to feel like they were like, you know, Phantasm was on the right track when they, you know, they went on the road with <laughs> Reggie. I hope Reggie shows up in one of these Ash uh, episodes. That, that would be, be a great crossover. Fantastic. Let's move on out of horror into some Marvel action that's happening on Netflix. Jessica Jones, the full trailer hits the web. So Netflix and Marvel's second series, Jessica Jones, the trailers just hit the web and we're introduced to not only Jessica, but Luke Cage, as well as the villainous Purple Man. This series looks fantastic with a very different, almost supernatural vibe, but seems to be cut from the same dark cloth as Daredevil. Now, Robert, you've seen the full trailer of Jessica oh, Jones. I, I was blown away. I mean, I, I, you know, I wanted to see it because I like the alias comic so mm -hmm. much and it, that dealt with the Purple Man story. Right. That, um, what is it, Kilgrave story? Um, yes, Kilgrave. The, the, the Purple Man. And I love that villain. I mean, I love the portrayal, but but watching that trailer, that was better than I could have hoped. I mean, to me, it looked even better than Daredevil because mm. Daredevil, I loved Daredevil, but it was a little one note. But this looks like it's, you know, as nuanced as it can be. It looks like there's a lot more going on and the fact that she does deal with her because they didn't really deal with her former superhero life in the Alias comic. They alluded right. to it, but it looks like you're going to see some of that superheroic life. So I think right. that's great. But it looks dark and weird and twisted. And 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 David Tennant is as a purple man. I yeah. mean, come on, that shot in the police station where all the guns were. That was. I mean, that's. I can't wait. That's like you know. That's like 
that's showing the true horror of his power of being able to manipulate manipulate your mind, make you do things that you don't want to do, manipulate your memory. I mean, that's a really scary power. That's why I was saying it's, it borders on supernatural because it's like he's technically could be the devil. You know, right. it's basically he is that kind of power is like a frightening power. And then, you know, we don't really know exactly what Jessica Jones powers are right now. At the, the, the the TV version She's obviously super strong. I mean, that's like, you know, that's a given right there. I loved that moment in the trailer where the, the blonde girl goes, he says I wasn't as good as you or wasn't as satisfying. Mm. <laughs> you know, the implication. Right. Like, like, like this is his way of having sex is manipulating people's minds. Right. And, like he wants his he wants his greatest lover back and he's going to get her. Yeah. But it looks great. I mean, again, the production values look really high and she looks great as yeah. Jessica Jones. Ritter's an amazing actress. Oh. I'm really happy that they cast her, especially after her turn in Breaking Bad. Yeah. She was great in that. And I think the new Luke Cage looks great. I he mean, looks great. His attitude. I mean, I'm excited to see how they're going to put all of these projects, all four of, you know, and now they're already on the second season of Daredevil, so now it's going to be like five. And is there going to be crossover? Are we going to see Jessica Jones on the second season you're, of Daredevil? You're definitely going to see Matt Murdock in Jessica Jones. That's a fact. He's oh, that's in good. It, okay. You know, I don't know how they interact, but he's in the in the series. It's so. great. It makes me want to go pull out my uh, Marvel Omnibus and read the entire Alias That's right. If you haven't checked again. it out, Brian Bendis is, uh, you know, check out Alias. is what's not the te television series Alias, it's the comic book Alias. Right. That's where Jessica Jones got her start, uh, this series. Let's move on to the next one. We've got Preacher, the synopsis revealed, the trailer, coming next week, November 1st. It's going to play November 1st during a movie-length episode of The Walking Dead. We'll get our very first look at Sony and AMC Studios' production of Preacher. Now, Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and Sam Caitlin are in charge of adapting Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon's classic comic book series, I want. I just say, bring on the Saint of All Killers. I, I'm praying to all that's unholy that that character is in this how story can they arc. Not though. How I can know they, they not? have. They have to. I, I don't mean, know who's they, playing they, him though. I just don't know how. I mean, this is a pretty blasphemous comic, and in yeah. our in our red state, right wing, you know, wing nut tea partier. Right. I, how are they going to feel about? A show that's basically anti-God. Right. I'm, I'm sure Fox News will have a few awesome things to say about Preacher. I can't Preacher, imagine but. what's going to happen when this show airs. Yeah, I'm very excited. I mean, if you guys don't know what Preacher is, check it out. It's an amazing series. It ran from issue one all the way to issue 66. It's got a beginning. It's got a middle. It's got an end. Uh, basically, the character, Jesse, gets the the voice which is is that's his power is he basically is kind of like the purple man right he it, can it, it's true he tells you what to do and then you must do it well how about the fact that there is a character ours face a kid who shot himself in the face right and survived of, and survived and is one of the main characters on this show yeah. if that isn't going to get half the population of this country up in arms i don't know what is i mean this could be the most offensive television series if done right that we've ever seen. Or it could be one of the best television series ever made. Or and both. actually, yeah, and, and, and turn both. turn religion on its head the right way and make people think more about certain things. So I'm very excited to see what I Rogan and Goldberg and Caitlin have all put together to make this Preacher series. Well, and I think with Preacher getting made, it means that anything can yes. get made. I mean, you could go. My dream of an Atari Four series is very is not possible. Too far yeah, it's, off. In fact, it's very close to reality. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Speaking of Atari Force, Supergirl <laughs> premiered last night. So the very first episode of Supergirl it debuted last night on CBS with uh, Melissa Benoit. Benoit. Yeah, Benoit. Benoit starring as Superman's cousin Kara and her adventures here on Earth. It's, it, it got the highest viewed premiere of this entire fall season. Let's talk about Supergirl. You saw the premiere last I night. I did. You, think? you know, I, I saw it a while ago too. I, I love the show. I mean, what's interesting is that I think that even though Arrow and, and The Flash are darker, there's still a buoyancy to them. Mm -hmm. You know, the colors and uh, why does everything have to be dark? And I think this really set the tone. I mean, I think for a Supergirl show, it was exactly what we wanted definitely it, it's i if it had been dark like if supergirl was some emo you know goth yeah. chick that became trying to cut her wrist but i wish yeah, i wasn't no. invulnerable i can't cut myself <laughs> no i think it 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 
it really set the tone, and I really loved it. I loved the design of her costume. Yeah. I thought she was great. Actually, her costume was designed by Colleen Atwood, the same costume designer who worked on Superman Lives. So she finally, she designed the, the all the outfits that Nick Cage was going to actually wear as Superman. She finally get, got to do her super something outfit with Supergirl. I think it looks fantastic. I think it looks fantastic, and and I think it struck really the right tone. And, and it's, I would love to see more of the Superman universe. I'm sure they will, brought right. into the, the, the comic. I mean, who knows what they can bring in. The bottled city of Candor. Candor could be a, uh, I'd love to see that. I, I more loved, Kryptonian. I was, I was totally blown away at how much I actually loved this Supergirl pilot. I watched it with a lot of other people here at Movie Talk, and they all hated it. And I was really the only person who was like, really? I thought it was great. I thought it had this kind of like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer tone to it, had a lighthearted tone to it, which I actually think the DC Universe kind of needed, because especially with everything grim and dark, especially in the movie cinematic universe, having something that was like a little bit more fun, a little bit, not lighthearted, but just kind of just fun to watch, a fun action adventure film, this one just happens to have a woman in charge, Supergirl, and I thought it was great. And it's like some people were complaining about the girl power lines or this and that. I could I could barely quote one or two of them. There were one or two that was like, it's good to have a girl in charge or something. And so what? It's about time. That's what I have to say about that. I think it's like Supergirl, I think is a lot of people are doubting on it and kind of secretly hating on it, wanting it to fail. I think it's not only is it a big hit from yesterday, I think it's going to keep growing as a bigger hit. I do too. And I think, you know, on a broader sense, you've got Supergirl, you've got Ray as the main character in Star Wars. The Force Awakens. Right. I think, I think this is going to be 2015 and 2016 are going to be the years that that it solidifies the female geek contingent as being as bona fide as the sweaty male. Definitely, definitely. I mean, we're all we we've Woman. all achieved genre parity. The sweaties are now both girls and boys. You can't right. take that away anymore. And I think this show is an indicator of that. And the new Star Wars movie will pretty much put that nail. Yeah. So the, the coffin of episode one of Supergirl's out. Definitely check it out. You can see it online. I'm sure get it and check out episode two next week. I'll be watching it. I got a chance to see it early, like a month or so ago. And I've been waiting to see what episode two and three and four bring about. It definitely is deeply drenched in comic book lore. Well, now know? let me ask you this. If they could network, if they could figure it out, would you want to see Supergirl cross over with Arrow and The Flash if they could make that I happen? think it would actually work out pretty good. I mean, I know it's CBS and CW, but they're basically the same kind of station, and they could easily make something happen next year. I think it would be cool, though, for Supergirl to establish her series because right. they've already everybody else is kind of wrapped into each other there's arrow and flash and Le 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 i think it's league of legends or legends of tomorrow sorry yeah legends of tomorrow with adam and they've right. got everybody constantine's showing up right. they're all hanging yeah. out having parties where's supergirl she'll eventually show up but i think it's cool to establish her show establish the tone of it i know? do too but i mean are they gonna is there gonna be a news report about what super are they gonna kind of like slide it in there like in, you know, in that city today, we saw Supergirl rescue a plane. I mean, is Flash going to hear that on the radio? Hey, that's not a good, it's not a bad idea. I think that's a good way to, you know, yeah, get just, that in just there. Yeah, stay, you know, just to let you know. Or is it another Earth? Does yes. Flash have to go to another Earth? So definitely Supergirl? check out Supergirl when you get a chance. It's a lot of fun. It's almost the opposite of what you're, you're, you'd expect from what DC was putting out with, like, Man of Steel, which had, like, you know, a little bit of a heavier vibe to it. This is definitely, if you want to have a fun, action-packed superhero film, check it out, the series. So And good for the whole family, too. Definitely. A real family show that's fun and, and a, a, I think, a great entry point. It's probably going to be a, a, a entry point for girls. They can Definitely. watch this, turn, maybe turn to comics. Yeah, or guys. I thought it was cool. So minor mutations, let's go right into it. Number one, we've got Mark Ruffalo officially finally confirmed as Hulk and Bruce Banner in Thor Ragnarok, or what I like to call Thor Planet Hulk. Number two, we've got Wonder Woman. Plot points are revealed. We've got Cersei, Ares, Batman. They're all going to be involved in the new Wonder Woman movie. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the plot and some of the stuff that was revealed this week. Number three, we've got Joe Cornish and Shane Black added to the list of Gambit directors. How many more people are going to be added to this list until they actually figure out who they're going to get? I think it should at least grow to at least 10 different directors. Number four, we've got Baron Zemo is not wearing a mask in Civil War. A blasphemy. Uh, number five, Ben Affleck confirms that he's in the running to direct the Batman. Now, we all thought this was locked down, but he's like saying, he's saying, no, I might be really interested in this. You know, I, maybe he signed the deal, maybe not. He's playing games, whatever. He's probably going to direct it. Yeah, he's going to direct it. Uh, six, we got Alan Tudyk is going to be the Blue Beetle if his best friend, Nathan Fillion, plays Booster Gold. 
I think that's great casting. Number seven, we got Peyton Reed is seemingly definitely going to be directing Ant-Man and the Wasp unless something really bad happens. And finally, in Minor Mutations, we've got Zack Snyder talking about why Batman has the edge over Superman. Basically, he said, the advantage that Batman has is the goodness of Superman, he explained. Batman knows how to exploit Superman. So we, we got a lot of minor mutations. Let's mutate off of them. What do you want to talk about first? Well, I think Wonder Woman. The thing that excites me that Ares is going to be in the Wonder Definitely. Woman comic. One of the great, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, I thought one of the great uh, results of that was the George Perez Wonder Woman run when he was writing and drawing. Fantastic run. Fantastic Incredible. Run. And the a Ares as the villain yep. for a while. I mean, he was like the villain the first six issues. Yeah, he was a main villain. He was a main, he was so good. And and I love that. If you guys love Wonder Woman and you want to read a great, there hasn't been a lot of definitive Wonder Woman storylines. They've tried, but they really, honestly, trying. you got to go back to George Perez's run. Right. And you can get it right now as an omnibus. If you just go anywhere, just buy the giant omnibus. I think it's, it's like 40 issues. It's yeah, amazing. it's really, really good. And, and the idea is because... If you're going to make those characters, the pantheon of Olympian gods, exist, right? You know, and they they're part of the Paradise Island or whatever. I like that. And if they're going to put that in a movie, yeah, how interesting for the DC cinematic universe. So smart the way they're taking Wonder Woman, and they're like, look, you know what? Marvel has Thor. We have Wonder Woman. They're using Asgard. Just like, a, how do you say it? Themyscira? The Themyscira? The Themyscira. Themyscira? Wonder Woman's Them, I don't know. Like secret you know, island where her and a lot of other goddesses hang out. That's going to be the Asgard. That's going to be... So basically, Wonder Woman is going to take place both World War I, where you have Chris Pine as Steve Rogers. I mean, I'm um, sorry. What's his name? Is it Steve Rogers? No. Yes. Yeah, Steve Trevor. Steve Trevor. Yes. Thank you. Steve, Steve Trevor. Rogers is yeah, Captain, Captain America. America. Yes. So... Basically, World War One, and then to the present day, and they're basically saying Batman, Bruce Wayne, is going to also be in the ending of Wonder Woman. It's, it, that's why I was I was hearing it's a prequel. That's how they meet, or something like is that. She, I mean, I like the idea that she's immortal. Yeah, you know, she's a goddess or a, a demi goddess or whatever. Right. I mean, I think that's a great. It's really interesting because how do you bring in the Guardians of the Galaxy and Thanos brought in the cosmic right. pantheon to of characters to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and and we've got Earthbound. I mean, is there going to be a tie-in with the Kryptonians, maybe? Who Probably. Knows? I'm, I mean, I hope she's not made of clay. That would just be like, yeah, you no. know, you got to go back a little bit too far. Like when she was first fighting Ares and she was like the, the kind of bondage laden, molten uh, original Wonder Woman. So it's like this kind of like, you know, I don't think they're going to go that far, but they're going to definitely have, you know, Ares, Cersei, and they're going to have this kind of mythology built up. So. I just want them to bring in uh, Donna Troy, man. I, uh, I, I want Wonder Girl. Because well, you'll probably I love, get Wonder Girl, and, and the, the, you know the multiple who is Donna Troy storylines. You know the, yes. the retconning of who she really was. I still don't know who she is anymore. Uh, you know, and she's, go to Earth Seven, and you'll find out. Uh, what do you think about Baron Zemo not wearing a mask? Well, look, he's got to wear. I understand that that an actor doesn't want to cover his face right. the entire movie. Unlike Carl Urban in Judge Dredd, give it up for Carl Urban yes. doing that in Judge Dredd. Um, but but come on, I mean Baron Zemo, you got to at some point at least pay homage to that that look because it's so iconic yeah maybe he's wearing it one at one point in the movie i'm hoping that they at least squeeze it in once because it's it is one of the weirdest looking characters you have kang and then you have baron zemo and those guys both look freaky and weird like kang was like some you know pharaoh and then he was just like for no reason i'm gonna wear this bizarre circular head mask right. which is weird purple <laughs> he's insane looking and then you have baron zemo's basically he looks like right out of the cosby show remember that guy used to wear a sock over his head or whatever <laughs> i mean he basically he's got the weirdest look of a super villain he's like do not try to stop me i who wear the strange fabric over my face and of course it's the worst color in the world like yes. it's fuchsia or something. actually talking about it now you're con i'm convincing myself that maybe it's a good idea that he because it's so weird maybe they so Weird. The actor was like, dude, really? I'm going to have this kind of weird stretched out. I'm hoping is at least in one scene where he's robbing yeah. a bank or something. <laughs> so uh, Ben Affleck confirmed he might direct Batman. Hey, uh, you know, I, I think he's turned it into a fine director. That'd be a good choice. Yeah. But, you know, again, he's directed himself. He did it in the town. He did it in Argo. He did it. it he's he's yeah, I think he, he can definitely do it. And uh the other one I wanted to talk about was uh, Alan Tudyk as Blue Beetle and Nathan Fillion. Now, that's basically fan-generated. Like, right. every sweaty nerd who loves, like, 
you know, fireflies are crying, their brown coats. It's like, hey, bring it back. I want it too. I'm not making funny. I'd love to see more Firefly. Josh, Josh Whedon, sorry, I just said Josh. Josh Whedon, please do more Firefly. But as as it is, they need to eat. They got to get a paycheck. So they're doing the con man thing. They're all doing, you know, they got different series in development. This would actually work, oh, I think, personally. I, I, it's great casting. I mean, and why not? I, I think that uh, those two guys... Who, could, who better to play Ted Core than Alan? To, yeah, right. He's, 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 it's great. And especially because then you've got, I love Maxwell Lord. And if they do the Blue Beetle Booster Gold series, who's going to play Maxwell Lord? I don't know, but there's a lot of people who could play I know, Maxwell but Lord. I think it's great. The two of them have great chemistry together. Have you watched Con Men? Not yet, no. It's pretty good. It's funny. You know, I, I liked it. I, they, they have, they've had chemistry in Firefly. So that's why I was sort of like, wow, that's kind of a, a no-brainer. Right, you know? right. I just want to see somebody. Can you imagine you're in a network executive meeting and someone says, so this character's name is Booster Gold? What? Yeah, Booster. Boost, I mean, Very really? weird, you know. I remember buying that first issue. Dan Jurgens. Dan Jurgens, And I'm like, Booster Gold. And the, the, the S in Booster was the dollar sign. Mm. And I'm like, why am I buying this? I love Dan Jurgens. Right. I do. But I'm really buying a comic called Booster Gold. Yeah, I got to be honest. I never bought any of those Booster Golds. Because I, I just, I, at that time, it wasn't even like, it was so, I would have to say it's, it was so ahead of its time as far as like superheroes selling themselves. And like, you know, remember Mystery Men? Like, the, you know, the one character yeah. had all the different like, you know, commercials emblazoned on his outfit. It was sort of like, it had that same kind of jokey mentality to it where it's like, hey, I'm just going to sell myself. I'm a superhero. What's up? Of course, you know, that's been now done to death in a good way where right. it's like people are right. like, oh, it's, it kind of makes sense. So Booster was like, the character himself was a little ahead of the, Head of the curve. Uh, you know, I only bought the. I think I bought the comic because he was from the future. He's from the twenty fourth right. century, I think twenty fourth to twenty sixth century. I uh, one that. of those. And he had skeets, and I liked his costume. Yeah, he was and a little Dan Jurgen, shiny, Mister Shiny Gold. So <laughs> let's um, let's move on into a, a thing I like to call flashback, where we're going to talk about a very special superhero movie that came out. It was called Kick Ass. This came out in two thousand ten. It's based off the ultra violent comic by Mark Millar. And John Romita Jr. This adaptation was directed by the talent of Matthew Vaughn. And it starred Kick Ass. What was his name again? The guy he played Quicksilver. Well, Aaron. Aaron Taylor Johnson. Aaron Taylor Johnson. Aaron Taylor yeah. Johnson that's right. And the other guy, also his friend, eventually played Quicksilver in the X-Men. I think his name's Evan uh, uh, Peters. Evan Peters, that's right. Sorry, I just couldn't think of either Quicksilver. Um, so yeah, um, Johnson played Kick Ass and with a young Chloe Moretz as Hit Girl. And the incomparable Nicolas Cage rocking a perfect Adam West delivery as the tough big daddy. Now, this comic was made uh, as a social commentary on superheroes at the time when Mark Millar was writing it with a viewpoint that Kick-Ass and the rest of these heroes were part of the real world. And in the real world, people get hurt and people die. Right. So let's talk about Kick-Ass. You know, I loved it. I mean, I, I remember seeing it. it. It struck the tone... That's the thing. It had the perfect tone from the comic. I mean, they were able to recreate that where it wasn't kind of... I think you just brought up Mystery Men. Mm -hmm. Mystery Men, I thought, was alienating to me because it was just monumentally dumb. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy it. It was very it. jokey. Very jokey. And I didn't like it at all. But Kick-Ass, it was called Kick-Ass. They knew, but they pulled it back and they made it realistic. They made it dangerous. Mm -hmm. I mean, that scene with the guns between Hit Girl and her father and all that was... You're like, wow, okay. They're shooting each other in yeah. the chest. He's really He's shooting, really shooting her. her. Yeah, that, that, that can't go over well. But I, I thought the movie was great. I loved, I loved Kick-Ass. I mean, I, I thought it was the perfect... It was a great, one of the best comic adaptations, too. Yeah, for they sure. did a great job adapting the subject matter. Yeah, I mean, the, when the original comic came out, it was just as brutal as the movie. Right. I mean, you know, certain things happened differently. Big Daddy died a little differently. The ending was a lot different. But basically, it was... They pretty much kept to it, the same kind of storyline where this kid basically gets hit by a car, and because of this, he basically doesn't feel pain anymore. Right. And because of that, it's not a superpower. It's actually, he is hurting himself. He just doesn't feel it. Right. So he can punch you a hundred times and not feel like his fist is broken. And isn't Mark Strong the father the, the, uh, um, of yes. McLovin's father? Yes. Uh, he was great. Yeah. He later Strong went on to was, play Sinestro. Yeah. The less we say about that, the better. He was great, though, as Sinestro. <laughs> he was great. But, yeah, I mean... You know, Kick-Ass had a lot of amazing, you know, character roles in it. It was really fun. Hit Girl was so much fun. She was so good. Yeah, especially that scene with her in the, you know, in that little I should point hallway. Out, I should point out I do not have a Hot Toys figure of Hit Girl because I don't make one, but Medicom 
Japan's Metacom makes right. a hit girl figure. This so sweaty nerd there. over here, Mr. Hot Toys. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, if you haven't seen Kick-Ass, they did a sequel, Kick-Ass 2, which was fun. It just didn't li live no. up to Kick-Ass the first one. It, was, it wasn't horrible. It was a no, fun sequel. Um, I don't know if the, because it was not as great. It was great. no Superman 3. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it was definitely no Superman 3. And we won't get a Kick-Ass 3, I think, because of the, you know, the Kick-Ass 2 not really, you know, right. hitting it so hard. But Kick-Ass, the original Kick-Ass is really worth seeing. I really loved worth seeing. I loved Big Daddy because the way, they, the way they made him in the movie is they made him exactly like a combination of the 60s Batman played by Adam West and the 90s Dark Knight where he's like... He's going to kill you. Right. you know? he's no, a, it was he's, good. Yeah, he's like the Punisher. Well, that was Batman. another thing. I mean, I think it showed the cost of superheroes. Yes. And, and people died in this movie. Yeah, because they were going to comic book stores in the movie. Right. They were like, they would go to a comic book store and have a hamburger and talk about things. In Kick Ass, it's like, wow, they, you know, he had to make his own outfit out of like some scuba gear and stuff like that. So right. it's a lot of fun. So definitely check out Kick Ass if you haven't seen it. Uh, we're going to hit uh, Spotlight next, which Spotlight, we're going to talk about a comic book that hasn't been turned into a television series or movie. And this week, we are going to say it's Trans Metropolitan. Now, Trans Metropolitan, I've seen the future and it looks like Trans Metropolitan. Warren Ellis and Derek Robertson created this world with a magnifying current events by magnifying current events and they laid out a future filled with hybrid aliens rid conspiracies a garbage filled dystopian society barely hanging on to sanity and chronicling it all is the journalist spider, spider jerusalem. jerusalem so let's talk about this crazy series you know again it, it was one of the great post sandman vertigo series that came out i mean mm -hmm. there was sandman's my favorite comic book of all time because it's a comic book that's about storytelling mm -hmm. That's what, I mean, literally the basis of all stories is what Sandman delves into. But this was one of, this uh, comic book was so, well, it's, it's insane, but you also, he's kind of like a, um, uh, you know, the, the gonzo journalist. Spider Jerusalem is yes, Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson. Yeah. And you've got this futuristic Hunter Thompson running around, and, and like you said, this crazy dystopian future where you never know what's going to happen. You know, kind of, kind of, it's, it's not... Like we talked about the goon last time, right? But it's that kind of thing where the, everything is possible, yeah. And, and you never know what he's going to do next or where he's going to go. And there's, I, I thought it was one of the most satisfying reads. It of, definitely is. And they just collected um, the I, second volume. They have one absolute version. The second right. one is coming out very soon. It's worth it if you haven't checked it out. This is a great way to catch up on. I think there's about 28 issues or something like that per per yeah, omnibus. Yeah, yeah. And Derek Robertson's a phenomenal. The artist. art is incredible. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of fun. It's really trippy and weird, but you can follow it. It's not as out there as some of these other futuristic stories sometimes. No, get. it's not as weird as the filth. Say. Yeah, the filth is super weird. It's so, super weird. You know, but that you know, the, there's different different kinds of future dystopians. But it was interesting know, that you know dystopians. DC. Comics was doing. I mean, Vertigo really was groundbreaking. If people didn't catch up on the Vertigo right. stuff, there was a lot of really interesting stuff that they were doing. And this is one of my favorite ongoing. Preacher was another. Yes, Vertigo I would say Karen series. Berger was right. incredibly responsible. I think she was the editor in chief of Vertigo for many years, and she greenlit so many of these amazing titles that all of us were benefited from. No, and being I, able to I, see. they really changed the comic industry. And I think Transmetropolitan is also very influential in the movies that are being made. Today. Oh, definitely. I think guys like Darren Aronofsky must have read every issue. Of I'm Man. sure, you know, and you that's know. one of those things where they, you know, they maybe just soaked into the back of their brain. Right. Like, yep, there you go. Definitely worth I've, getting. And there's a lot of actors who could play Spider Jerusalem out there right now. I want to see someone like shave their head and wear the red and green like weirdo glasses. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, let's get into some Twitter questions from you guys. This week we got Rory Smith asking, post-Infinity War, could we get a new Avengers team with Doctor Strange, Ant-Man, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, and Spidey? What do you think of that team up? I love it. Bring it on. I mean, there's no way that they're going to be able to keep paying Robert Downey Jr. I know, 75 however million. However much money he's going to oh get. Oh, my God. Um, but uh, why not have a cool... It, it, look, they're doing a great job. The fact that they've greenlit Ant-Man and the Wasp, right. they're moving right into these things. As long as these uh, films stay as strong as they are, and who's to say I, I would not bet against Kevin Feige, why not have a team up like that? I think it doesn't be smart. matter who the characters are, as long as the team up story is great. You know, a great way to introduce Nova is because they've already introduced the Nova Corps. Of course, like they're like, look, Earth, we're gonna and send one of our emissaries to right. be your policeman, just like the Green Lantern Corps. This one Nova Guard is gonna be the well, official guard of Earth. After after the Chitari attacking Earth, now it makes sense, right? You know, now there would be there's gonna be much stronger ties between the cosmic universe 
Yeah, so Marvel whatever happens in the Infinity Wars with Thanos and all those gems, some weird shit is going to happen with the gems. Right. So once that's all over and we have another Avengers, yeah, it's definitely going to be a different team. It's probably not going to be Cap and Hulk and Thor and Iron Man. They can cameo. Yeah, they could, you know, I don't know if Robert Downey Jr. needs 75 million if he's in it for five minutes. Maybe only 50 million. <laughs> Who knows? But yeah, they're definitely going to change up those teams. And I welcome that. I think I it'd too. be great. Um, let's move on to the next question. Daniel asks, what are your thoughts regarding Krypton, the prequel TV series of Man of Steel? Now, David Goyer last year was talking about he developed this series called Krypton, where they were going to go like 200 years before the, the, the time zone of Man of Steel. So it's like 200 years earlier. So we get to kind of see like maybe the House of Jor-El and some of the, you know, the different cultures and, you know, wars that were going on. Yeah. The, the development of Krypton. What do you think of that? I think it's a great idea. I mean, I always liked when they, DC would do like the Krypton miniseries yes. or, you know, whenever they'd go back and examine the, the culture because it was, let's face it, never examined. I mean, you had the bottled city like we talked about right. with Kandor, but, but Krypton was gone. The, it, Krypton, by definition, was gone when Superman began. Right. So we never knew what Krypton was. Although, you know, I would hope that it has a great science fiction concept. I hope the world is, I mean, I, I, would, I would see it as a sci-fi Game of Thrones. You nailed that. it on the head. It would be fantastic if they were able to do that. Now, going back a little bit to Supergirl, we saw a, a, like one minute right. of, of of the Supergirl's version of Krypton, which kind of didn't really hold up to the Man of Steel version of Krypton. I kind of really liked where they were going with that, and right. I would love to see even like if they were going to you know, kind of amalgamate a bunch of ideas into Krypton, they could use some of the cool ideas that they were developing for Superman Lives. They could use some of the ideas that they had from the original Superman, the movie. I think they could build that into and make a really cool looking world from the, all the ideas of Krypton. Right, especially if they had a large, like a Game of Thrones cast of characters where you had different houses, like yeah. you could see how they compete for for power on the planet and you could deal with the colonization efforts that we heard about in Man of Steel. I mean, there's so many cool ways they could take that show. Yeah, man, I mean, the Krypton that we were introduced to was definitely like right out of Brave New World where right. they're like birthing children. It's illegal to have a, a natural child. There was some weird stuff going on. Yeah. So if they, if they kind of extrapolated on that, like how did they get that messed up? Here's where they started, you know? So I think I would love to see Krypton move forward. Me too. All right, next question. We got Joshua Tissonia asking, as comic book movies continue to diversify, do you think an Adam Strange pre-52 would work on TV or movies? Now, when, he, when he's saying pre-52, for those who don't know, they're talking about the reboot that DC did about a year and a half ago. It was called The New 52, where they kind of like canceled everything and launched 52 comics, canceled about 12 of those, launched 24 more. So it's, I don't really know where the 52 is technically, but the Adam Strange before that was quite an interesting cool science fiction character what do you think about that character? well you know his look i liked his look because he was retro he was right out of the 40s you know he was he was like rocket man mm -hmm. uh where where uh, uh the rocketeer came from that totally he was 30s. like flash gordon meets rocket man absolutely and i thought that was really cool and he was you know from from his he was from uh, was he from Ran? Adam Strange? Yes, Ran. R A N N. Yeah, R A N N. He was, and I loved. God, dude, we're so sweaty. I know. We're so super sweaty. nerds so coming sweaty. to you like today. Is, you know, know how many planets have we memorized? Isn't it lives? horrible that all this stuff it resides in the back of our brain until some other nerd is like, "Remember Adam Strange? I know Ran. He's from the planet Ran with two ends." <laughs> <laughs> so. There was a great. Uh, um, prestige format series. Yeah, it was a four Adam, issue four, at Kubert's. Yeah, and yeah. it was great. And I remember thinking, you know, if you go back and read that, that Adam yeah. Strange miniseries, it was great. If Yes. The, the question is, yes, a new 52 or a post, a pre-52, new, a pre-new 52 Adam Strange would be awesome if it was done correctly. Right. Like the Kubert's uh, miniseries. That or, was a great miniseries. Like we're, we're positing the idea of like Krypton, like you said, a, a science fiction Game of Thrones. Adam Strange can rock that same type of universe, yep. you know? It's like it has all the elements of action adventure with science fiction. So I would and, love to and see it. And there's a pulp, you know, that pulp sensibility totally. from the from the 30s and 40s. Yeah, and, and I think we're going to be we're on the verge of a brand new renaissance. Like after 2017, I think a lot of the things that were pulp back back then are going to be refreshed in a lot of cool ways. Well, what's interesting is all these period shows. I mean, you see like Aquarius, and now the show about the serial killers on the Sunset Strip, or right. Scorsese's new. Uh, 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 a music industry series that's mm -hmm. on HBO vinyl that looks great. But I like the idea that like Boardwalk Empire, let's do a superhero Boardwalk Empire. 
you know, why not go back to the 30s, do a shadow series totally. back, set in the 30s? Be I mean, fantastic I think that, to see that. I'd love it. All right, let's move on. We got uh, Donald asking, will we see the soul gem in Doctor Strange and what movie will time gem show up in? So this is a question once again about the Infinity Stones and where these gems going to show up in. Um, it seems like the soul gem would make sense if it's Doctor Strange. What do you think? Well, that, I think that's the obvious place to put it um, because obviously it works on the astral plane, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? And that's where Doctor Strange does his best work. Yeah, we're going to see the so. weird floating, like <laughs> semi-translucent version of yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch floating into another dimension yeah, it, in I a few wait. months. Yeah. I can't wait to see that. Now, it makes, it makes perfect sense, and why wouldn't they? Now, the time gem seems to be more of a sci-fi Guardians of the Galaxy 2 maybe. Right. I mean, would there be a time element in that? I don't know. And Probably. that's the thing. I mean, I know James Gunn is going on record as saying, you know, time uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is not going to directly relate to the Infinity Wars. And he's saying they might not show up in it, but I'm pretty sure the Guardians are going to show up in Infinity Wars if it's dealing with Thanos, because right, that's completely woven into the Guardians of the Galaxy. One of the main characters of the Guardians of the Galaxy, Thanos is her dad. So it would be kind of weird. I get what he's saying, though. He's, he's like, look, we're developing Guardians. We're doing it. We're, we're not tying in all this heavy storyline stuff, which I really respect because that's one of the reasons I don't buy a lot of Marvel or DC comics anymore is because they keep doing these like crossovers where like, you got to buy 700 comics. Yeah, and they, nothing really, really ties in or relates really too much. They kind of are kind of ruining everything that makes comics cool. So they got to knock it off and figure out a different way. I know that they just did a re, 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 relaunch just like last week of like Iron Man and Doctor Strange and hopefully this is like a clean slate so like not only can uh, younger uh, readers like get in on something and like hey I want to pick up you know the Invincible Iron Man or something and not have to buy like 700 comic books but I wanted to bring up this point I think our modern industry of comic books is being ruined by the 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 failure to recognize the past now what was so great when I was a kid is like Batman was issue 732 or something like that. And we're like, oh my God, there's so many issues. Now the way that Marvel and DC, is, as far as what I've heard about like what some, certain editors and other people in charge think is they're like, well that, that dates us and makes it seem like it's impossible to ever catch up. There's too many numbers. But it actually has the opposite effect, which is I think a little more true. It makes people who get into this, they're like, oh my God, there's so many amazing other adventures that I could read about this, and this is, there's a certain continuity that is really important when you're like, hey, Dragon Man, you know, from Fantastic Four first showed up in issue 35, or the Inhumans, the Karnak's first appearance, or these kinds of first appearances are all washed away when you do this, you know, a rebooting of issue one after issue one after issue one, and now we're in a different universe, and this one doesn't matter, and that one doesn't matter, and I don't know what universe I'm in. Melt them all together, make a new universe, and then blow that one up, and now there's 500 other planets. No, I, I look, I, I was a huge, I still am, I'm a DC fanboy. I love Marvel Comics too, but I, I came to comics with the DC universe, mm -hmm. and I love the idea of Crisis on Infinite Earths, because Crisis on Infinite Earths, when it created the, the one world, the crisis still happened. Right. Like there was still this event that caused this one world. And they could always, if they wanted to, they could blow it up and go back to the pre-crisis universe. They didn't do that. Right. We had we had other things happening, you know, whether it was zero hour, right. millennium or whatever. But but I love that continuity. I mean, I love the idea that there was Superman one and Superman two and the JSA was thirty years behind us. You know, we were in front of them, and you. Could, right. I loved every year when the crossover happened. The Legion of Superheroes America, were like third in the thirtieth century, yeah. and I loved all that. I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, that's what made it fun to read the DC universe, and you could memorize all this stuff. Right. Like where where. So they're Adam trying. I know the DC universe is trying to bring that fabric back with the multiversity with Grant Morrison doing his best to weave together like seven thousand planets. <laughs> right. Like Batman Beyond is from this weird world, so I'm like, look. At least they're trying. I know Marvel is trying in certain ways, but honestly, it's, it is it is kind of a mind eraser. And when you go back to Crisis on Infinite Earths, that was like Marv Wolfman was right when he said, hey, look, every 25 years, you need to clean house. Yes. And then after that happened, it was seven years later that they cleaned house again. And then seven years later that they cleaned house again. And then three years after that. And then three years after that. Now it's every year. 
Well, th there's this idea that you have to be able to start off a universe for new readers from the beginning. Well, that's why people aren't reading comics. And I disagree. I think right. people love that continuity. People, anybody who gets into a book series, whether it's the Game of Thrones series, whether it's Lord of the Rings, you know, you read the Silmarillion or you read the appendices of these books and you, you find out the house of this person and this person lived with this person right. and 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. It makes it living and breathing. We want to get into that and know all of it. So why get rid of that with your superhero universe? Yeah, they're successfully ruining everything that they've built from the beginning. I mean, there's people like Eric Larson with Savage Dragon. They're keeping the numbering system. It's like issue 213, and then you pick up the newest Spider-Man, it's issue two. Right, and it's it's not, there's it's nothing cheapening wrong it. with that. It's, we all know there's different eras. The right. same way, like, you don't say that this, that, that um, the new James Bond movie, Spectre, is the fourth James Bond movie, because right. it's the fourth Bond movie starring Daniel Craig. Right. It's the 24th James Bond right. movie, and there's different Bond eras. Who's your favorite Bond? And the whole history of the franchise is what makes it fun. That's right. And keeping that history intact and alive is what's so important that both DC and Marvel are just failing at giants, well, giant they're size. They're know? trying to grab. They, they're trying to grab a market that I don't think exists. Right. You know, they've got to deal with the fact that comic book, the comic book readership is now what it is. It's not what it was 20 years ago. It's what it is, and you should concentrate on that. Celebrate your history. Right. I mean, and make it a part of everything that you promote. Yeah. Why not? Why not make the fact that you've got this many years of this character and all these different eras and all these different artists? I mean, the Marvel does at the beginning of every movie. They, got, they flip through different eras of their comics you see panels you right know? but those are all on different earths and different you know <laughs> dimensions so don't don't bother searching too Aren't hard for those battle world now yeah you know <laughs> i get the tie-ins you know and i like that they went back to secret wars i think it was that was like right around the same time as crisis was happening so i right. like those kinds of big book things that happen but unfortunately when they drag every single title into it every year they have these big summits where we've got to have our next secret wars we i mean and that's what they do so they kind of not only stifle and ruin the creative writers who are working their ass off to make really cool stories happen with these characters that a maybe haven't happened already so they got like 60 years or 40 years of back history that they're trying not to repeat I mean, there's a there's so much there's so much there that can be done yeah. without having to ruin everything by just not acknowledging the past. You can use the past. Well, and also the, every time a new movie comes out, it's like, uh oh, we now have to shape our comic book to tie in with the movie right. itself. That's very true. And it's interesting because the Marvel Cinematic Universe was informed by their own Ultimates versions of these characters. Totally. And now they have to change the comic the reverse book. engineering. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. Just, it's like you know. That Samuel L. Jackson was drawn in the Ultimates, right? You know that, right? It's like, I know hardly anyone knows that. They just think that that's who Nick Fury was from the movie. Right. It's kind of crazy. So thanks for that question and like launching us into this weird sweat fest. <laughs> um, here we go with Matthew Levasque asks, Hey guys, with, with Justice League Dark mostly confirmed, will we see Zatanna in Justice League Part 1 or Part 2 or a standalone movie? What do you think? Well, again, I mean, it's such a crazy... You're, you're now bringing in the mystical. Right. You know, I mean, she's a sorceress or maybe just a magician, but basically she's a sorceress. Right. And if you're going to bring her in and suddenly bring magic into the universe, which is one thing that Superman is, of course, yeah. vulnerable It'll to. Screw him up. I mean, maybe that's a smart thing to do, but tonally, how do you bring magic into the Batman v Superman universe? Well, I, think I mean, you've got to you've got to introduce it slowly. Magic will equate similarly the way they explained it in Marvel's Thor. What's magic to you is like science to us, right? And I think that's a really nice way that Marvel introduced the whole idea of other worlds, other dimensions, aliens, uh, superpowers, all that kind of stuff. And I think I I feel like DC, with the tip of the hat to that, is going to take that and run with it with Batman v Superman. Look. Superman is an alien from another planet. There's already like the science fiction elements already there. Absolutely. But it's done in a way where you can believe that. Yeah. Whereas this is sort of a weird thing to say, but can you believe magic in that universe? I mean, like you said, if it's explained as advanced alien technology, it seems like magic, that old Arthur C. Clarke thing, any sufficiently right. advanced technology would appear to be magic to a primitive culture. Well, I mean, with DC, I think there is that supernatural element that's more so there than in marvel when well, maybe we'll see it in suicide squad i think you know? we will with enchantress we're right. going to see that opening of that kind of 
that world coming in a little bit more. I think Zatanna will stay in the world of Justice League Dark before they've already got like six thousand characters that they need to introduce for Justice League and the rest of all the you know the regular DC universe. I wouldn't mind seeing like the Demon, Swamp Thing, Zatanna. Oh. Uh, you know, Etrigan. I yeah. love Etrigan. So those are the characters that should be in Justice League Dark if that movie actually gets made, which I think is a great idea. They should move forward. I on. do too. But what about if you know if you go the magic route? How long before Mister Mixelplick shows up to uh, torment? Yeah. As long as it's done like the Alan Moore creepy demon, you know that's <laughs> still I think the best version of that character. All right, we've got our very last question. It's the sweaty question of the week, and it's by Robert Johnson. He nailed it. Do you think Paramount will ever make Infestation? It's the series that had Transformers, G.I. Joe, and Star Trek with a sprinkling of maybe Ghostbusters involved. What do you think about Infestation and will Paramount actually combine all of these franchises to make the sweatiest, nerdiest freak film ever? Never. This sounds right. <laughs> it will never happen. First of all, the G.I. Joe is owned by Hasbro. Right. It, it, you're not going to have Hasbro wanting to cross over or give any of their money away to other franchises like, say, Star Trek. Right. Um, I mean, it's a cool. That's the ultimate fan service idea. Like, how do you make that work on 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 screen? Right. Like, how does that going to going to work? It's I almost mean, it's almost impossible, and I would say it will never happen. I agree with you. I picked it because it's a good question. It is a and good question, and it's like, there. Well, why? Why can't that happen? It's happened in comic books. Well, guess what? Comic books are magical in the sense that they have a writer and an artist and an anchor and a colorist and sometimes maybe one or two other people, but that's tops six human beings on the planet working on this. If they were making this, it would involve literally several thousand people and that's before they ever got even to page one of a script. It would be like 300 lawyers on each and every one of the individual sides, the people who own all the rights, all getting together and having a fight about who gets more character screen time and what is, what is you know, Baron, uh, you know, uh, just name one of the characters from like, what is, you know, Destro, Kirk, Destro and Kirk. What are they going to do when they fight Optimus Prime? You're like, I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. Is and, and, Alien involved? And, and you know? again, if you can't use the existing characters that are like Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto to play Kirk and Spock, right. you have to hire new characters and then introduce who they are. Right. I mean, it would just be an enormous. I I think maybe as an animated film. You read my mind. I was going to say, you know what? The only way possible that I would even see this, you know, super freak out happening would be in an animated movie where it'd be like, you've got. Transformers, you got Star Trek, you got G.I. Joe. But I could, you know, you know G.I. Joe and Transformers are both Hasbro. Yep. So maybe that could work. Like, you know, you had in the first Transformers movie, there was a military component yeah. to that. Actually, in all the Transformers yeah, movies. Yeah, it would make why sense. Couldn't the Joe, why couldn't the Joes suddenly take over the uh, uh, custodianship right. of the Transformers? Enterprise shows up, Gary Seven's involved. You're like, what's happening? Right. So, we've just come back from Cybertron, <laughs> which was destroyed. And That's right. You know, actually, now that you mentioned that, Maybe I could see that. Yeah. And the Ghostbusters show up for no reason. Hey, is any ectoplasmic uh, readings going on here? Yeah. Kirk is actually a Well, ghost, the Cybertron, you know? isn't their world dead? So what if they're dead ghost Transformers? There you go. Someone write that up. We, Robert, he just broke the story. All right, that's it for us this week. Episode 30, Collider Heroes. Robert, where can people find you online? Uh, people can find me at Instagram at RM Burnett or on Twitter at Burnett RM. Or you can find me, uh, all things Axanar, at Save the Federation or Klingon Victory. Or find me on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. Awesome. And you can uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp or at TDOSLWH. Holly Payne and I will be at, at uh, Stan Lee's Kamikaze this entire weekend at booth 329. Stop by. We're going to have posters, Blu-rays, DVDs, a whole bunch of cool stuff from our film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened. Uh, we've got panels that are happening. We're screening the film. The, the entire movie will be screened at 1 o'clock on Saturday. We've got a movie talk panel with everybody, Dennis, Wendy, Cam. Pia, the whole crew, Ashley, the Schmoes will be there. Everybody's going to be there. They're, it's right after the Schmoes No panel. Uh, that's on Sunday. So definitely, if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, get your tickets right now for Stan Lee's Kamikaze. You've been watching episode 30 of Collider Heroes, and I will see you next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.